We'll start out with a couple questions this morning to wake everybody up. And hope you had a good rest. We're going to be spending the next 50 minutes or so talking about complications of AF and ablation and how to avoid them. Uh, certainly complications of all these procedures are fair game for boards. First question is, what is the most common cause of death in AF ablation? Fistula, stroke, tamponade, sepsis, or MI? So um, we have a correct answer there. 50% said cardiac tamponade, which is the correct answer. I'll show you the slide later in the talk from the Worldwide Registry. Um, actually, I was a little slightly surprised when I saw this course. I think of the fistula, but that's a late complication. And it's also, uh, while there's a high mortality rate with fistula, um, there's actually many, many, many more tamponades and typically the unrecognized ones are what lead to death during the procedure. Now let's have the next one. Which of the following does not contribute to stroke and AF ablation? Appendage clots, air, fistulae, platelet activation by transeptal, lesion-related thrombus, all of the above are active contributors. Very good. Two thirds said all of the above are active contributors, and indeed uh, they do. Air embolism usually complicating transeptal puncture and esophageal atrial fistula, again, while not immediate during the procedure, and that may have been the confusion here, certainly uh, does cause embolism and stroke in the two to four weeks after uh, this starts presenting after the uh, procedure. So let's go into the discussion. Uh, Doug Packer mentioned yesterday the uh, consensus statement that came out four months ago from 48 of our colleagues on four continents concerning AF ablation. Uh, again, if you haven't read that and want a nice review of current state-of-the-art thinking about AF ablation, both surgical and catheter-based, I'd encourage you to read it. It's about 80 pages, but it's or organized nicely and uh, it's pretty clear. These are the current indications. Of course, symptomatic atrial fibrillation. Uh, we don't have an indication for asymptomatic atrial fibrillation for ablation at this point in time. Patients who are refractory or intolerant to at least one antiarrhythmic drug carry a class 1A indication for PAF. That's the 1-1A one, one that we have. 2B for persistent and longstanding. If you look at patients who have never seen an antiarrhythmic drug, and that'd be about 10% of my practice, PAF has a 2AB indication, and the other persistent and longstanding are 2BC. So <clears throat> really the, the main one that has a 1A where everyone kind of agrees, yeah, they've failed a drug, their PAF, that's a class one indication. The rest are twos. The outcomes of AF ablation were also discussed in the consensus document and all the issues related to extent of follow-up, extent of monitoring that's done, patient mix, volume of the center and the operator doing it, definition of recurrent atrial fibrillation, cost of the procedure, and associated complications all, uh, I think, in the document they have been tr striving to get some uniformity across our discipline as far as reporting these outcomes since this has been an area of great confusion and has not really advanced the science that much as far as understanding outcomes over time. So complications. Complications, of course, are part of everything we do. <clears throat> this graphic I put together many years ago, just uh, again, as we have gone further into the AF ablation realm the last 15 years, the types of patients that we see have become more persistent chronic. They become older, they have more comorbidities, 
And as such, we can expect more complications uh, with them and have to be more fastidious as far as controlling them. This is the laundry list of complications. I'll come back to this slide later in the talk, again, showing examples. So uh, just to highlight a few of these. So stroke and TIA, and again, these incidences either come from worldwide surveys, meta-analyses of some of the randomized studies that have been presented, or single center studies that have presented um, complication rates with their outcomes. So the incidence of full-blown stroke and TIA, 0 to 7 percent, fair number again beyond the order of a half a percent average. Doug talked yesterday about this issue of silent embolic microemboli, anywhere incidence on MRI scans of 7 to 38 percent. The significance of these long-term to neurocognitive testing uh, and uh, neurologic function is unknown. These types of phenomenon have been seen after other types of invasive cardiac procedures, including PCI and um, uh, congenital closure device therapies, so they're not unique necessarily to RF ablation or cryoablation. Also, the time course of these lesions as they develop on MRI, whether some of them disappear or continue to uh, occur over time, is unclear, and studies are underway for more long-term follow-up on these patients. Air embolism, the incidence is less than 1%. Again, usually that would occur at the time of transeptal puncture, uh, either because of air entrapped within the uh, transeptal sheath or related to um, air that's in one of the side lines that uh, uh, go into the sheath. Uh, of course, management of this, most of the time this is going to present, uh, you'll see it initially after the transeptal is done with ST elevations in 2, 3, and AVF, the right coronary when the patient is flat is typically the highest uh, portion of the aorta, so air is more likely to go down that. Uh, of course, it can occur with injections of the coronaries, but usually it's a uh, RCA, ST elevation, and resolves within a few minutes. Patients should be treated with 100% oxygen uh, at the time, and uh, in general, they don't need any other treatment beyond that unless the changes persist. Pulmonary vein stenosis. The incidence when we looked at this in our series here in the late 1990s was 5% across the board. This would be patients who developed vein stenosis, either symptomatic or asymptomatic, with more than a 50% stenosis. This re reduced to 1% in the early 2000s and currently 0.3%. As uh, learning curves have improved, ultrasound has aided in positioning the catheters more intimate knowledge of the uh, pulmonary vein atrial anatomy, I think for all those reasons, uh, the incidence of this has dropped over time, thankfully. We'll talk about how these things present uh, with some of the case examples. Pericardial tamponade, 02 to 6 percent. You know, again, it really depends on which series you're looking at, but uh, again, I think that's a fair number, uh, some, the truth somewhere in between. These are generally during the procedure. Uh, the patient will present with hypotension, vagal episodes, Kussmaul's breathing. If you have ultrasound, many times you'll see the effusion developing before they develop hemodynamic com compromise. <clears throat> there is late tamponade also that can occur. Uh, it's less frequent, so maybe 10-15% of the cases of tamponade after AF ablation are late. They can occur I would say most of those are going to be in the first 24, 48 hours, but some can occur out to 30 days. Some of it's late bleeding from a, a hole that wasn't detected. We certainly have seen patients with reactive tamponades, particularly if they're getting a lot of lesions, they may get a significant pericarditis and then a, a reactive pericardial effusion that presents late. Vascular bleeding, 0 to 13 um, percent. In our own practice, I think this has been reduced by adding the sonocyte uh, ultrasound imaging, which again, as an older person, I didn't think would be necessarily helpful, but I thought we should have it in the laboratory. And actually, it has reduced uh, significantly the amount of uh, pseudoaneurysms and fistulas that we have. 
I think Paul also mentioned yesterday using warfarin through the time of the procedures. It's clear that we get more bleeding post ablation if you have to bridge with heparin. So if you can do the moncumin, I think that does reduce that risk. Esophageal atrial fistula incidence 0.1 to 0.25%. Ulcerations, if you do EGD on these patients and look in everybody, the ulcerations are present in a fair number, one in six. So there's a discrepancy. A lot of them have ulcerations. They're really not a good marker for, for uh, the eventual uh, fistula. As you know, these will present typically in the two to four week time period after the procedure. Um, they can present in a number of different ways. Sepsis with leukocytosis, dysphagia would be one. Seizures with embolization of either food or air to the brain would be another. Um, Multi-organ failure would be another. GI bleeding would be another or some combination of those. They don't occur in the immediate day or two afterwards, but typically two to four weeks. I should mention on the pulmonary vein stenosis, the typical presentation there is anywhere from three to 12 months. Um, some of these stenosis, well, I'll come back to that uh, later in the talk. Moving ahead further, um, in addition to the esophageal atrial fistula, you can get damage to the vagal nerve in, as it's tracking down the esophagus. We've seen a couple of cases of mega stomach and poor peristaltic function in the GI tract as a consequence of interruption of the vagal nerves into the uh, GI tract during posterior LA ablation. Again, like phrenic nerve injury, it's transient but can lead to significant uh, morbidity for multiple months after a procedure. Acute coronary occlusion, very rare. The most common time you'll see this would be creating the mitral valve uh, line out laterally in the left atrium. The group in Bordeaux uh, reported an instance of 0.2% of circumflex occlusion with creation of that line. Um, again, with experience with that line, typically I end up ablating within the coronary sinus out laterally probably a third of the time to achieve block. And I think that's probably where the opportunity to hurt the circumflex is, is when you're doing that ablation set. So typically cutting powers in the CS 20 watts or less would be helpful to try to avoid that. And also moving the catheter towards the atrial insertion rather than the ventricular side of the CS would avoid uh, getting near the circumflex. Radiation burns, fortunately, we don't see anymore. The second case we did here, a uh, patient had a superficial burn on the chest after getting about 2,000 rads. Fortunately, now with all of the other imaging techniques, learning curves, radiation burns are extremely rare. I did see one uh, from elsewhere just around Christmas of this past year, a patient who had a uh, cor complex coronary intervention, then two AF ablations within a week, and per uh, we were looking at the patient and had a nice uh, dermatitis from radiation uh, entry burn on his back. So they can still occur. And again, work with your biophysicist in your respective labs to try to reduce uh, exposure. Pericarditis, the incidence is anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. There is a literature regarding steroids after ablation. If they get a significant uh, pericarditis, it does reduce the risk by about two-thirds. Pericarditis is associated with a higher AF incidence early, although it's not clear that it's linked with any late recurrences. So you'll see a lot more AF as you would after open heart. Dresler syndrome, again, pretty unusual. Uh, I've had a handful of patients. I think it's probably a similar group that gets the late reactive effusions, but these patients can continue to have chest pain months after the procedure, elevated sed rate, CRP. They also um, are very sensitive to fluids, so even if their ejection fractions are normal, they tend to retain fluid and can be diuretic sensitive and diuretic dependent for multiple months after the procedure. Phrenic nerve injury it occurs more often with cryo than RF. Again, a fair question for the boards. They might throw that one out at you. 
Uh, usually with RF, the only time you get into the phrenic nerve would be if you're isolating the superior vena cava, if you're doing a lateral atriotomy, flutter in the right atrium down near the IVC. Those would be the two main reasons where you'd get into it. Or if you got very, very far into the left atrial appendage during an isolation of that, you could tag the left phrenic nerve. As you know, with the cryo balloon, particularly the smaller balloon, the 23 millimeter, in the European experience where they use that balloon a lot, if you pushed it way out into the right superior, less so the right inferior pulmonary vein, you could get the, um, the phrenic nerve. And the incidence in the European experience was about 7 to 10%. So recommendation for cryo balloon, of course, Medtronic has advocated pacing the, uh, the phrenic nerve simultaneously w when you do freeze those two vein targets to make sure that you don't uh, tag the, the phrenic nerve. Virtually all of them recover. The recovery phase is variable. It may go out to 15, 18 months as far as uh, when the, the diaphragm eventually comes back. About half the patients are, uh, have uh, symptoms from it, so they'll report dyspnea, poor exercise tolerance. The other half will be essentially asymptomatic. Mitral valve trauma from circle catheters. Again, incidence, one in 300, 500, 700. It's kind of hard to pin down. We don't really have a good large series of this out there. Um, there, the problem is that the circle catheter, particularly the smaller ones, the 12s and 15s, will get entrapped in the mitral valve apparatus, and then someone tries to twist it out, and it just makes things worse, and eventually you have to have the thing extracted either percutaneously or surgically. We talked about death, um, and we'll talk a little bit about the proarrhythmic effects later in the talk, too. Uh, some people don't consider this a complication. If you get a uh, reentrant atrial tachycardia after uh, you place the lesion sets, um, I would agree if you're doing large circles, that may be a consequence of it. But if you leave gaps in lines that you're creating in the left atrium, um, you certainly can be prone to having that. So what are important things before you plan to send the patient to the laboratory? Again, avoiding complications sometimes is avoiding the procedure altogether. So look for any underlying causes that might be uh, reasons for you to treat the patient further medically before bringing them to the lab. Search for sleep apnea, endocrine issues. Remember the first few years we, did, we weren't looking for thyroid disease and we picked up a whole bunch of hyperthyroid patients after we started screening for them. So look for that. Occult valvular heart disease is another common one. You know, mild MR on the transthoracic echo on the TE shows two jets that are severe. Well, you're probably going to want to plan a different approach for that patient. Is there a familial syndrome? There's really no good... Uh, gene testing, Mike Ackerman will be talking about genetic testing in regards to channelopathies this afternoon. We really don't have a panel to look for this in families, but it's good to at least uh, know about it beforehand. One other thing I'd mentioned, occult syndromes, besides MR, we've also seen uh, several occult hokum patients show up with atrial fibrillation too. So. Um, I would say, again, echo may not be the gold standard to pick that up, and we found it on some of the CT or MR uh, scanning we've done prior to the ablation. Anticoagulation, again, our approach right now, and it's a work in progress, is to do these patients on warfarin throughout the procedure. Even with giving warfarin, heparin is imperative. ACT targets and the... Um, what we use, and in the consensus, 300 to 400 seconds. Uh, using Coumadin, certainly you can pull sheaths and reverse them at the end. Sedation, this was, an, again, I don't think this will be tested, as Doug said yesterday, because there was no consensus uh, amongst the experts publishing the consensus document. Some labs do this under conscious, some under general. And um, so I don't think they could ask anything about that. Additionally, they're not going to ask anything about some of the newer uh, delivery techniques. I don't think they would ask about, for instance, laser versus RF. They might ask RF versus cryo, questions related to that, either complications or effectiveness. Again, re general 
rule of thumb, RF more effective than cryo, cryo safer than RF. Robotics, they're not gonna ask about that. Again, it's too early. And some of the sensing contact systems, the cardio, uh, uh, the endosense, the J&J &J product, the uh, sensor with the Hansen Robotics, they're not gonna ask any questions related to any of that. In regards to how to deal with the transeptal, when we first were doing these back in the mid 90s, we put transeptal sheaths in kind of like we'd been doing for valvuloplasties and diagnostic casts. So we placed the sheath before heparinization was done. We'd get everything in place and then we'd heparinize the patient three, five minutes after the sheaths were put in. We found out as soon as ultrasound became available that this actually was associated with a relatively high incidence, four, five, six percent of thrombi that was developing on the hardware in the left atrium. As soon as you puncture the, trans, uh, the transeptal membrane, you initiate platelet activation. And in some patients, this is enough to generate clot formation on the hardware that you've just placed there. So, that was an eye-opener when ultrasound became available 10, 12 years ago, uh, and they changed our practice. So we typically heparinize beforehand. Consensus document really didn't talk too much about the timing for the heparinization, and uh, it's interesting. I travel around the country and the world, and this practice has not really been uniform, but we felt it was important to heparinize, particularly if you were using ultrasound as a way of um, keeping the procedure safe. Um, the other thing that we do is make sure that the sidearms of the sheaths are continuously infused with saline heparin during the procedure as well. So what else can be done to reduce uh, complications, enhance safety? Well, if you can't see it, you don't know what's going on. I think I learned that from using ultrasound 10 years ago. So both the imaging and the mapping systems I have liked. Um, we know that pulmonary veins are the targets. Again, as Doug said yesterday, if they ask questions about techniques related to AF ablation, isolate the vein, then isolate the vein, then isolate the vein, and then do it again. That's, and that came out in the consensus document too. That was the one thing they could all agree on was that the pulmonary vein should be isolated and other than perhaps Dr. Paponi and a few other people who still use voltages for deciding if the vein is isolated, that also meant using a circal catheter to reassess if there was connection of the vein potentials to the left atrium. This is uh, from Cook's lab, again, just showing in AF patients who have recurrence. This is PAF patients, most of them, third with recurrence of AFib at eight months follow-up. 80% of the patients studied had recurrent pulmonary vein conduction. All of you know this. This is typically what you would find if you had a redo and you went back, you're going to find one or more of the veins are going to be reconnected and are going to still be the trigger sources for the atrial fibrillation. Um, this would be the same in a surgical series. This is a non-cut and sew maze series, just a handful of patients, eight patients, who had recurrent atrial arrhythmias following uh, maze, three done with cryo, four with RF, and one microwave. Again, surgeons have the same problems as we do in regards to recurrences with the techniques that they use outside of cut and sew. Cut and sew, very good. Very rare to get any recurrent conduction out of the veins once that procedure is done, but with all these modified procedures and the hybrids, the surgeons have the same issues that we do in regards to PV reconnection. Again, none of this is going to, none of these next couple slides are going to be uh, on the boards. There, suffice it to know, there's multiple different imaging modalities being used in interventional labs around the world for imaging the left atrium, the pulmonary vein geometry. Some labs just do a venogram injection venogram or a Dyna CT of the left atrium at the time of the procedure, and uh, just use a couple lasso catheters to guide their wide circle ablation. Others use CT merge with electroanatomic maps, Navix you know about, and then there's multiple different techniques using uh, ice now, both 2D and 3D, and I'll show a few pictures of those too. 
I think, again, when you're first doing AF ablation, it is helpful, as most of us did in the mid-90s, to do some venography initially to get an idea of the vein anatomy and how it sits. The venogram may be all you're left with if you've got a patient who has horrible ice pictures on a given day and you can't really image very well um, at, the, at the time of the procedure. So I'd learn all of the techniques. Uh, venography, again, is useful at the beginning of the learning curve for this, and I think uh, bails you out when you're having troubles otherwise. These imaging modalities also have other desirable features, and depending on which one you're using, you know, again, for echo, maybe pretty good for targeting in conjunction with electroanatomic mapping. Some of these things that are on this list, we really don't have an imaging technique that will give us um, uh, some of the information that we want. Minimize patient and provider radiation exposures. That's a pet peeve of mine. And um, there's been several things that have reduced this besides your own personal learning curve. I do think uh, 4D mapping reduces that. Um, robotics, which I've started using the last couple of years, reduced it significantly just because I could have control of the map now rather than having the technician control the map. That really facilitated reducing the amount of times I had to spend uh, with the foot on the pedal. So it will be different for different labs as far as what equipment you have, what your experience with this is. But I would get, uh, encourage you to get some experience with most of these and then pick the ones that you think uh, work best for your lab. The intracardiac ultrasound I mentioned, besides showing us clots within the heart, uh, it does give you the ability to establish where the venoatrial junction is very nicely. So you can see, actually see it, see when your catheter is there, see when the lasso is near that area. Um, there are other ways to establish venoatrial junction. Of course, you can do it electrically with differential pacing and see where the uh, atrial and PVPs uh, joined together. That's another useful way to establish that junction. The Doppler portion of echo we also like as a way of establishing uh, where hardware is. And if it's in an appropriate position, I'll show an example of that. For instance, with the cryo balloon, you can establish if there's a reasonable seal on the vessel by doing color Doppler and assessing whether there's leaks around the vein or if it's uh, got a good uh, fit. I mentioned uh, monitoring for clots. Probably the most important thing besides the transeptal on heparin that I like the ice for is evaluating hypotension, which comes up very frequently. It's not that common. It's tamponade. It's usually too much anesthesia or the patient's dry or some other uh, reason, but uh, it's a good quick way to look at, make sure that you don't have a, a tamponade that you should act on. So here again, just a still frame of a right inferior pulmonary vein. Here is, this would be the septum here, right inferior pulmonary vein. This is the crina. The right superior would be over here. So again, this would be um, the tip of your lasso catheter here. So you can see one spline of it here and one spline of it here. So you can see if the vessel is actually uh, large enough to admit the size of lasso that you want. Here's the ablation catheter. The blue arrows show where we would have ablated in 1996, the red in 2000, and the green for wide area at this point in time. So again, you can get a very quick look as far as where the catheter is and how it's sitting in these veins. And again, much more so, I think, than typical venography, particularly for the superior veins where the superior aspect of the vein as it lays on the left atrial roof, uh, usually people are in the vein further than they think they are. The other thing ECHO will give you with the left veins, of course, is the variation uh, in, of the uh, atrial or venous anatomy in the left veins. There's variability in both the right and left veins. Uh, about 20% of patients will have a right middle cardiac vein or multiple uh, uh, right uh, medial pulmonary or right pulmonary veins. The left, uh, about 20% will have a common antrum, and sometimes this carina is recessed quite deeply inside the, the left common. 
This anatomy you also, of course, get from your CT and from uh, your MR if you're doing those before the procedure, but this is real time and again gives you information uh, that you can use to position catheters and monitor therapy. This is a 78 year old woman during the transeptal. So, again, uh, you can see the coronary sinus here, the imaging catheters in the right atrium. Left atrium, usually the punctures are done somewhere near the level of the left veins, uh, which you just barely see here. This little dot right on the tip here is the light up of where the needle is, and then the dilator is here. Now, in this case, um, we were doing the transeptal, and then all of a sudden saw we were pulling back and then saw this little thing here. Now, again, if you're not doing this with ice, you don't see this. So it's like anything. You don't do the ultrasound. You don't see what you see a lot of things that you wish you hadn't seen before. Dr. Friedman has seen this before because I know you've had a case of this as well. I don't know if yours looked similar or not. But so what is that? Well, it kind of, you know, okay, maybe it's a clot, but, you know, it kind of has kind of an oddball look to it little bit of a spiral look to it and we got it out this is the piece here it's not very big but it was a little bit of a scored segment from the needle as it was coming up through the dilator it had scored off a portion of the plastic from the inside of the um, sheath and basically that's what we had this is a medtronic needle if you look at the bevel on this and actually saint uh, excuse me, both Medtronic and Bard have bevels up at the top of their needle, whereas St. Jude, the bevel is just the opposite. So the sharp portion is on the bottom. The Medtronic in particular, I don't see it with the Bard needle, even though this is scored the same way, but this needle, if you put it up through these sheaths, even different sheath than this, it, it really gives you a lot of this type of motion as you're moving it up through the sheath. So I've abandoned using this for the most part for this reason. Well, this next one, again, it's just ultrasound showing a cryo balloon in a pulmonary vein, just showing the color Doppler as we're seeding the balloon in to achieve a seal. I think, as you know, you can do this hemodynamically. You can also do it with contrast. This is nice. Again, I think it's very reproducible. You don't need to give much in the way of any contrast to the patient. So again, another use for ultrasound that I think is helpful. This is also showing similarly ultrasound positioning. This is uh, one of Brian's slides, actually. I have a few of them in here. Um, just showing a watchman placement in the left atrial appendage. And for those of you who have done watchman or amplats or are doing the Lariat device, you'll note that uh, ultrasound's pretty important as far as positioning those devices uh, and making sure that you've got seals over the appendage. Again, this is my favorite. This is one of the staff members here, actually. Um, and her blood pressure was normal at this time. In fact, she had this effusion for probably 20 minutes before her blood pressure tracked down. I think why the deaths occur with tamponade is it goes unrecognized, and then everyone panics, and the patient gets sent to surgery abruptly, and then bad things happen uh, as the snowball rolls down the hill. So again, I like the ultrasound for a number of reasons. This is yet another reason is you do know, you you get asked about hypotension not infrequently, particularly if you're doing it under general, um, and you can just look. Okay, it looks good. It doesn't look good and move on from there. The esophagus, again, we talked about the main, the, the main predictor as far as predicting fistula or ulceration is the amount of fat that's between the esophagus and the left atrium. And you can see that distance on CTMR. You can see it uh, kind of with ultrasound at the time. Um, there are four approaches to reducing, well, we're talking about this space right here. So 
This is the interface between the two. In this particular patient, there's really no interface. The left atrium is right up adjacent to this and over a fairly large portion of the esophagus. Um, I'm going to skip these echo pictures for time. and come back to these images here. We'll show some with the esophageal uh, monitoring and how to try to avoid the fistula. First off, um, this is a manifest patient with a stroke. 37, he came out of the procedure. Um, he was confused. Everyone thought it was post-op confusion. It persisted for about six hours and then the MRI was taken. These patients, again, I mentioned on one of the initial questions, the mechanisms for their clots can be varied. Uh, they can have clot in the left atrial appendage. One thing in the consensus document about how to screen for clots in the atrial appendage, they still recommended TEE as the gold standard, not intracardiac ultrasound. So you can miss them on intracardiac ultrasound. You certainly can see them very well sometimes, but TEE should be still the gold standard. If they asked about that, you know, how would you screen for clots between uh, before doing your AF ablation? It should be TEE -E and not ice. As far as thrombus formation, this is a question they could throw out there. Uh, this is uh, from Mark DeBook in the group in Montreal. Just looking at the cry initial experience with the cryocatheter versus RF. Again, more circumscribed lesions with cryo and less thrombus seen in these animal studies of cryo versus RF. So cryo theoretically leads to less thrombus formation compared to RF on the surface. Um, I don't think they're going to ask any questions specifically to any of the occlusion devices, nor do I think they're going to ask really much in regards to the novel agents at this point in time. I think they're mostly still going to be interested in guidelines <coughs> that revolve around vitamin K antagonists. Um, know something about pulmonary vein uh, stenosis management. Again, the stenosis will typically first get picked up three to six months after the procedure. This is a patient CT showing right inferior pulmonary vein progressively stenosing. Here there's about an 80%, 70% stenosis, and then at six months a subtotal occlusion. These patients, about a third of them will have no symptoms whatsoever when they stenose off a vein. So we've seen plenty of patients with complete occlusions of a single vein and have no symptoms whatsoever. And yet you have other ones where they have two 80s on the same side and get hemoptysis and cough and you know, pulmonary infarcts and then develop subsequent pulmonary hypertension. We were shown a case, Paul, last week in China where both left pulmonary veins were completely occluded. And the VQ scan showed basically no perfusion to the left lung and very, very patchy ventilation. The patient was asymptomatic three years out after the procedure. So I'm amazed how patients can both probably collateralize venous return from their lung, but they also have the ability, some of them, to auto-regulate the lung and reduce ventilation to that lung so that they don't have as much of a mismatch or symptoms. If you're going to intervene on these, it should be done before they get to the point down there where it's subtotally occluded. So if you do have one, they have some symptoms and you're concerned about them, the time to go after them would be back here at this three month film. About half can be managed just with PTVA, the other half because of recoil and recurrence do require stent placement. And again, just showing the placement of one of those, this is in a superior branch of the um, left. I mentioned that the uh, incidence of this has dropped off over time. Again, one other reason for it is, again, because of our lesion sizes are moving away from the osteums. This slide's courtesy of Packer. Um, this is animal work that he did with a cryo balloon. And just emphasizing, even though cryo has a reduced 
incidence of thrombus. And I mentioned if you get a question, they're asking you, should you ablate this anteroceptal pathway with cryo or RF? Probably always choose cryo. But cryo can cause damage to adjacent structures, um, and none of them are, are out of uh, line here. It can cause esophageal erosions. It can cause pulmonary vein stenosis. It can damage the phrenic nerve we know from clinical trials. It can cause intracardiac thrombus. Um, here he's showing damage to this uh, animal's left lower lobe related to venous infarction. So uh, certainly cryo, uh, it does ablate tissue and it can cause collateral damage as well. This is from his animal work. Again, just emphasizing how if you get an undersized balloon, what happens? You get the balloon far into the vein. You get really cold temperatures, which you say, gee, this is a great contact. We got real great temperatures here. But those low temperatures due to seals far in the vein also are more likely to stenose as they are to cause phrenic nerve injury too. Um, I'm going to skip here and talk about the esophagus. So I think, as you know, the esophagus does have a variable interface, and it's not reliably in the same place on one day as versus the other. These are just three different patients we looked at many years ago, showing the black dots were the esophageal interface with where we were placing the circles at that time. So it's very variable. I'd say more often than not, it would be this pattern over here where it's interfacing close to the right inferior pulmonary vein. Sometimes it, you're lucky and it's right down the middle, but more often than not, it's this pattern here. You do have an option as far as where you put the roof line. I would encourage you to put them up top rather than bringing them down the posterior wall too much. Uh, additionally, the, the uh, uh, um, esophagus, it may be uh, even inside the pulmonary vein sometimes. So I have uh, seen a couple cases where patient, uh, people were actually doing just segmental osteal ablation and got esophageal fistulas because the esophagus was actually right there at the base of the, uh, base of the vein. These are the four approaches advocated in the consensus document as far as reducing the overall incidence of this. None of these are validated. They're all hunches. Um, modifying the energy delivery was used by three quarters of the people in the consensus document. So instead of 30, 40 watts, burning 15, 20 watts on posterior wall. Or the modification uh, or uh, the other way to do it is kind of just drag over that area to make the figure look good, but not to re really release any energy. A second would be visualizing the esophagus and abstaining from ablating anywhere over it. So you image it with ultrasound. You can kind of see where it is here with our thermal probes and just not go over that area. Thermal monitoring can be used. We don't know what the actual increase in temperature should be or shouldn't be. I mean, I usually I'll avoid going more than two degrees above, but I have no idea if that makes any difference. The problem with the thermal probes are it's very, they're very dependent on where they are. They could be on the left side of the esophagus, the center, anterior, posterior. And of course, if you're really doing it correctly, you'll be moving the probe while you're doing the circles. So they're fraught with a lot of problems. I use them more as an anatomic guide rather than the thermal monitoring portion. The first case I remember we did under general after, uh, I think it was the eight millimeter came out, we put a probe down. This was before any of these cases were presented and the temperature on the probe went to 44. Um, again, we worked the patient up for uh, malignant hyperthermia, but again, then realized that it was actually from our lesions that uh, we were getting the temperature increase. I don't think they'll ask about what the cutoffs would be, but they might ask what are the approaches to reducing this that you can, that you can do. This just shows, again, uh, some work we did looking at if you do get temperature changes either up or down, and you can see it go down with cryo 2, there's a latency when you come off power temperature continues to change for about 45 seconds after you've come off. Um, again, just from using the small balloon versus large balloon, this was, again, animals. This predated the European experience. Smaller balloon, 
get into the vein further, better seal, lower temperatures, but more likely to damage the uh, phrenic and also stenose the patient. I think I am getting close to being done now. Is that right? A couple things I'm going to finish up with just about recurrent arrhythmias. I said that uh, ablation, uh, you know, having a reentrant atrial flutter after AF ablation, some people consider it a complication, some don't. I think it's a complication if you haven't bothered to check your lines. And that's another thing that's in the consensus document that besides checking cavotrax cuspid lines, if you're going to do other lines, mitral line, roof line, CS lines, you should try to uh, document that you've got bidirectional block at the time. And if you don't, then, then ablate more. We talked, um, I'll s skip this one. That's a ligament of Marshall figure from a dog. This one just again shows the three common reentrant atrial arrhythmias that follow AF ablation uh, with wide circles and or lines. Um, yesterday, Bill, I think, showed a uh, case of mitral isthmus uh, flutter, then the roof flutter that's usually related to reentry around the right-sided circle, and then flutters that are kind of uh, drive you nuts when you have them, ones that involve both the atrias and usually the coronary sinus is part of the circuit as well. Sam had mentioned yesterday that the coronary sinus has multiple connections back up into the atrium. And of course, when you're doing an MCV pathway, it's better to ablate on the ventricular side than atrial because of all these connections. Those multiple connections also provide the ability of the coronary sinus to act as a fifth chamber in the heart, if you will, and can participate significantly in some of these reentrant flutters, even outside of the vein of Marshall area. This is a 47-year-old with flutter, hohokam myectomy, and had a maze 3, which is the cut and sew. You can see typical after surgery that these P waves are very small, and it's very difficult to make much sense of P wave morphology. As Bill said yesterday, if the patient's had surgery prior ablation, you can't really use the P waves all that well to really guide where you're going as far as the ablation. Here's the activations, again, left to right activation on the coronary sinus with CS12 being distal. This is the map. Now, they could, you've got the left atrium over here, and this is a voltage map. Pretty much as would be typical after cut and sew maze, the posterior wall is all scarred. There was no signals there at all. You go into one of these cases, put your catheter on the posterior wall if there's no signals, you know, the surgeon's done a good job as far as cutting around the pulmonary veins. In this case, there were low voltages up top here, underneath where he had uh, created the posterior box, and also on the mitral isthmus. So this is the position of the catheters after the ablation was done. You can see it, we've got a catheter out in the coronary sinus here. That's where the termination of this line was. There's a coronary sinus catheter, one here, 20 here, and then a mitral isthmus catheter, one here and 20 here. So again, looks very similar to the orientation you would do to look at a cavotricuspid line. Notice with the termination, you've got the flutter going on here, but some delay and already reversal of the proximal CSs, a little bit more delay, and then termination with block there. This is again, like Bill's figure yesterday showing pacing at the distal coronary sinus, which is the one, two here in blue, and then showing reversal and mark delay as it goes all the way around and then comes through the CS this way. Additionally, the endocardial catheter shows the same thing. Now we've got 1920 in orange, which is up here near our pacing area. Double potentials here at 11 and 12, and then it reverses around and comes back the other way. Now pacing the other direction, same thing. So now we're pacing down here at the blue arrow. You go out this way, block, and then go all the way around and come here at CS12 and then proceed later as you come towards your block line. Same thing on the endocardial here. All of these are on the pacing side of the line. You hit the block line here, and then 
the electrograms at 19 and 20 are very late because, again, you've had to come all the way around. So I think I'll finish there uh, for time reasons, and uh, we'll move on to Paul.